Um, thank you. It's great to have the opportunity to speak today. Um, I'm going to be going back to schistosomiasis and actually to the um, same district in Uganda that um, Julia actually works in. So I've been working ooh, let's move that way, in, in this district, Mayugi, since 2004. And some of the schools started their control programs in 2003 there, and it started to roll out across the country. But not all communities were treated in 2003, and the ones that I've been working in, some treated in 2003, and some started in 2004. Um, and these three schools are called Bogoto Lakeview, Bawanda, and Masubi. And they're all highly endemic for schistosomiasis, and they're all on the shores of Lake Victoria. And when I was there at the um, beginning, this was actually back during my PhD in 2004, 5, and 6, this is just showing the intensity of infection, the mean intensity of infection in these communities that was really reducing over time. Um, and the mass drug administration was being administered annually, but at this time point, I was actually doing a longitudinal study following children up over time, giving repeated treatments. And in some of these communities, some children received up to 11 prasoquantal treatments in this time, but they were still positive when we went back. So that's obviously far greater than the national control program drug pressure. Um, but when you look at prevalence, even with those increased treatments, and these are cohorts of children, so the same children followed up over time, when you actually follow them up, by 2006, the prevalence in one of these schools had gone back to baseline levels. And I then went back to these communities um, several years later and what we saw is that now that they were 10 years into a control program, we weren't seeing any reduction in the prevalence in these areas at all. And indeed, if you look at um, the infection intensity, what we saw was that it was actually worse than it had been at baseline. So this was saying where they'd been doing their mass drug administration control program for 10 years, where I'd been working in one of the um, three of the communities, sort of treating repeatedly. Other people had also been there treating the people they'd been sampling, including people at Cambridge, not just Juliet's group, but lots of people working on immunology. So these communities had received far more than the vast majority of communities in this, in this country. And yet the infection intensities were now higher than they had been before the control program started. And um, when we actually went back in 2017, what you'll see, so this actually one is, the, um, is Bogoto, and we're seeing that it's still really, really high in 2017, so three years on. And if you look at praziquantel naive six-year-olds, so these drugs are administered um, to the school-aged children, but they're also administered to the community, but they're not administered to people under six years of age in these areas. And obviously we've heard about the pediatric pediatric formulation that's being produced, but in these communities, these are, this is where they're starting their prasoquantal treatment. And so what you can do is you can look at these new six-year-olds each year coming up into school who won't have previously been treated, and you can use that as a sort of sign of what level of transmission is happening in that community. So in each of these years, we've got a new cohort of six-year-olds. So in 2004, we sampled 30 children, 2005 and 2006, 30 more new people each time. And what we saw was that in 2006, there was indeed a lower prevalence of infection. But when we went back in 2013 and 14, we actually saw a significantly higher prevalence of infection in these, in these prasoquantal naive children. And I'd like to point out that for these diagnoses, we were doing three days of double catacats, so looking at eggs in the stool, and so using the same diagnostics at each time point. Um, and we were also doing circulating cathodic antigen tests. So these are actually using the same diagnostics, but the ones we're presenting here are purely from three days of duplicate um, stool analysis. And then when we went back in 2017, you're seeing that this is even higher. So now 80% of the children are being detected with infections just looking at the catacats alone. Um, and so one of the things we were sort of looking at is, well, okay, well, so for some reason, transmission is certainly remaining very, very high in these communities, and it's possibly increasing. But this country has been ongoing, so they've been treating for many, many years. Um, and many models predict that by the time you've given this many drug administrations, you actually would see a reduction in the force of infection, so a reduction in transmission. Not just a reduction in the infections of the people you treat, but in the rest of the community as well. And we weren't seeing that at all. So this is part of a much bigger study. Um, we've got immunologists, people working on population genetics of parasites, diagnostics, but the data here we're just presenting is more about drug coverage. 
And, um, and so what we were wanting to know is that lots of the models, um, they all make these sort of certain assumptions. So one of the assumptions um, that the World Health Organization has said is that to control morbidity, you need to treat 75% of the people. And they also make the assumption that the untreated individuals are often randomly distributed. And what that means is that each year you'll have, say, say for example, you were reaching 75%, which is uncommon, but say that would mean that one year you're treating this 75%, and then the next year you might be treating this 75%, and that you're picking up people each year as you go. Um, and they make an assumption that only of the untreated people, only 5% of them are what they call systematic non-compliers, meaning that they, each year they don't take the drug. Now, unfortunately, um, there's very little data on lifetime coverage of the drug, and Julia has shown some fantastic, amazing, enormous studies on these networks, and she's really showing um, that these people who aren't being treated are on the peripheries of these networks. Um, so one of the things we want to look at is really what proportion of people are repeatedly not taking the drugs, and then also why are they not taking them. So we went back to um, Uganda, back to my Uganda district, and we were in a school, um, a community called Bogoto. Now it's actually called Bogoto A and B, um, and it's very separated in that um, the Bogoto B is a much more kind of rural farming community, and Bogoto A is a more densely populated um, along the shores of Lake Victoria. So where Bogoto A is written is actually um, the Lake Victoria itself. And we um, went around and we actually surveyed every single household in the entire of those both communities. And what we were doing, this was part of a bigger mapping study, but whilst we were there we were asking people um, different questions about the, the ages and the occupation of everybody in the household and the sex and the age of the school children and also whether they were enrolled or not. We were also asking if they'd ever been treated for bilharzia and when they were last treated and then if they were treated last year where they were treated and um, if not, why not last year? And then we also um, sort of asked questions about um, whether they slept under a mosquito net, and this was verified by people checking inside the houses with mosquito nets were up, and also about we were mapping every single pit latrine and people's access to those toilets, and whether they owned a pit latrine or were using someone else's. Um, lots of people would say they were using a pit latrine, but then they didn't have a key to it, for example. So we were trying to find out if, if from where they use pit latrines or if not where they go to the toilet. So we actually surveyed 681 households, um, encompassing over 3,000 individuals, and using the national census data, that was estimated to have covered over 90% of the individuals in both of the communities. So we had really good coverage for the whole community. And then um, different statistics were carried out depending on the data. But for the models for the school-aged children and adults, they were performed separately. And then we first of all put in all explanatory variables and then removed them um, when they weren't significant. So first of all, just to show you the actual um, demographic population, so we really, we were, um, most of the demographic represents the U um, Uganda demography very well. We um, slightly over-sampled in the school-aged children because also we were based in the schools and we were know very, known very well there. Um, but that sort of does in general represent the Ugandan demography. And then looking at occupations, just to show on the top, you've got Bogoto A, which is the one that what you can see in um, green is the um, number of fishermen and then also the fishmongers. So in um, Bogoto A, on the right is males and on the left is females. And this is just demonstrating that there is a sort of diverse range of occupations in these areas. But in Bogoto A, the vast majority of particularly men are fishermen. Um, and in Bogoto B, um, they're both male and female, tend to be farmers. And then when you look at prasequantal coverage, so this shows um, if they were treated last year is in the dark grey at the bottom. Um, if they weren't treated last year but they have ever been treated was in the light blue. And then if they've never been treated is in red. And what you can see here is that a huge proportions of these people have never been treated. Now in the preschool aged children, that's what we'd expect, right? The odd person has been treated, they had sought out treatment for their preschool aged child. But um, if you look beyond that from age five upwards, you really see huge swathes of people who've never ever received the drug. Now we were showing them the drug, explaining them, and lots of them had said, no, we've definitely never taken that. Um, and they showed about different drugs that they had taken. So we believe that the vast majority of these do represent an understanding of which drugs they had swallowed. 
Um, but really just to highlight, so about 50% of people from 20 upwards had never taken the drug despite living in these communities um, for the um, duration of their life or for at least the last 15 years. And um, basically they'd not taken the drug during the entire control program. And these were the significant predictors for taking the drug. So living in Bogota B, you're actually more likely to have taken the drug, even though it's less likely to have been infected. So these were the more farming community rather than the fishermen. And we have parasitological data associated with this as well that shows that people in Bogota B have lower infection intensities. Um, then there were some of the predictors, obviously being enrolled in school um, was a significant predictor for taking the drug. Um, and then also residence during in the, the long you'd lived in the village um, was a positive predictor. However, that was actually um, interacted with your age. And what we think is that if you were older and you'd lived in the village a long time, you sometimes had treatment fatigue. So the chance of being treated last year was actually lower if you had lived in the village longer the older you got. Um, so from the drug coverage point of view, um, one of the reasons we want to know is, okay, a lot of these people have never taken the drug, but why is that? So everybody always calls them systematic non-compliers. But here is the tables both for the male and female of why they have never taken this drug. And what you'll see at the bottom in grey is the refused, which is a really small proportion. What you then see is a few of them were sick when the drug came. Um, then you have a category which we would call not bothered. So they knew about the drug, they'd heard about it, they knew they were eligible for it, but they went, well, you know, I, did, I wasn't really bothered. I heard about it, I didn't go along to the treatment. And what those kind of people might be mopped up, for example, if people were doing door-to-door. -door. So using the network analysis that Juliet's done, for example, and things like that, you could actually locate the people who weren't necessarily right by the health centers but were living in the peripheries of the community, both physically and um, socially, and actually go out to those and pro um, provide the drugs for them. And then the next one up is in the orange, which is not offered. And this category, we put in people here that were, had never heard of the drug, so they'd never heard of Prazacrantil, they didn't know they were eligible for it, they didn't know it was in, even available in town. And, um, and particularly this also includes adults who thought, well, it's only for children. So there was a real misunderstanding. This is a high endemic community and adults should be treated as well. And then the other one in red, which is of interest, is that lots of people were away. They knew about the drug, they expressed, expressed an interest in taking it, but they said, I was away that during that short time frame that the drugs are in the village. And this was touched upon earlier, and one of the key things could be making sure that drugs are remaining in those communities so that people, when they come back, actually can take the drug then when they return. And a lot of these people are also fishermen who are away, so they fish for several days at a time, they're heavily exposed to transmission, but they're not there during that exact time point of the treatment. So some of the simple things that you might be able to improve drug uptake in these communities. So what we've shown here actually is that 32% of the target population, so people from five years old and above, have never taken the drug in the com communities combined. And also if you include the younger children, that's 50% of the community who've never been treated. And as I showed you before, the prevalence and intensity is now very high in these untreated six-year-olds. So really we are missing a huge amount of number of people who might be um, transmitting the disease as well as getting morbidity from it. Um, we've seen, seen that the untreated individuals are not randomly distributed each year and that if you weren't treated last year if, then it, there's a high significant proportion of people who were never been treated at all and it wasn't that, that people who weren't treated last year had taken the drug once, it seemed that most of them had never taken it. Um, and therefore, also with the reasons we found that the people were often systematically not offered. So rather than being systematic non-compliers, they're systematically not offered. And I think this represents a key shift because I think it's very easy often to blame people and say, oh, well, we've got low coverage because people are scared of side effects. And if people are scared of side effects, that's also an education issue that we should be dealing with and the community and people distributing the drugs should be dealing with. But also, actually... If they've, if they've never been offered it, then that really isn't their fault. And it's up to us and up to the distributors to get the drug out to them. And so actually you could have quite high impact. So I know in these communities we have radios, for example. We could just make sure the radio announcements made sure people were aware that the drugs were for everybody and the drugs were free. Um, and then also, as I said, leaving the drugs possibly in the communities, in the local health centre or in the schools for mop-up. So this um, was just, as I said, some of the work are part of a bigger study, but these are the people who have been directly involved in a lot of the work in these communities, and I just want to say thank you to them. And then um, this is some of us in our team T-shirts, and um, that's the back of it. It says, Stop Shisto. 
Um, my grant's actually called Shiste Persist, which I was, we didn't want on the back of t-shirts because we were like, no, we don't want it to persist. <laughs> so we've had to change the entire name. And um, this was the newest member of our team who was born relatively recently. Thank you.